think the most important thing to say in any lecture that I put here on Paul Dunbar's We Wear the Mask is going to be kind of very surface level. I'm only going to touch on some, some a few ideas. I think a lot of you will want to write about this particular poem, perhaps, for your essay. And if that is the case, then I don't want to say too much. I do want to introduce the poem for those who have never read it before and don't know anything about Paul Dunbar. So, but I just feel like I have to start by saying there's no way I can cover everything. It's true of all of our poets, of course, but I feel like there's a whole three-day lecture to be given just on Paul Dunbar, and I'm about to speed through it. So, um, okay, and so here I go, speeding through it. Maybe the first thing is the form that he uses which is called a rondeau, and I found a quote from poets.org, um, a definition of what a rondeau is, and it's sort of perfect. I mean, I think what it shows immediately is that, I, I, didn't, I don't remember the term rondeau, I'm sure I learned it at some point, but, so I had to go and look this up and find out that this poem was written in a rondeau, so... But what's pretty extraordinary to me is, in fact, the Dunbar chose it. And it turns out to be perfect for what he wants to do because rondeau is the French word for round, as his definition explains. And so it means it comes back to, right? Rentrement, it can, comes back to this, returns to an idea over and over. And so you can see at the bottom, it starts the refrain. There should probably be an R there. It starts this refrain and then comes back to it. And it has this weird, you know, a quintent or five lines and then a four lines and then a six line. All very strange. And, and then the rest of it only has two different kinds of rhymes you can have. So this was a technically difficult poem to rhyme and to put together. And what it does by having just these two rhymes and this return over and over to the same phrase, we wear the mask, it just unifies, tightens, strengthens this idea. Um, so he's conveying this really difficult, interesting, important idea, um, you know, written in the late 1800s. He's doing all of this um, in a really tight form. So very impressive. I think the form really contributes to the power of this overall meaning. One of the key ideas here from the title, everything is this idea of a mask, right? Um, in fact, people, critics refer to it over and over as a trope. And a trope is just a figure of speech. And I found the best, I thought the easiest dictionary um, definition from Wikipedia. So it's, a trope is any kind of figure of speech, any kind of figurative language, meaning a word, phrase, or an image that you use to try to express yourself, like um, an allegory is one, irony is a trope. Um, but it's come to mean, and this is why I put in larger print, right? It has come to mean um, a recurring rhetorical device. And the mask is one in African-American writing. Um, it's an important one that people use for specific reasons, right? So we have this quote from Susan K. Anderson, disguise is a strategy of survival and Dunbar's masked fight for equality became a heroic legacy for African-American authors and readers. So there's this repeated when African-American writers write they use the form of the mask over and over to sort of represent this difficulty they have with representing who they are to a group of people who think they are less than, right? So this repetition, the mask becomes a, an important trope. And um, it is repeated the phrase, we wear the mask again, those three times. Very important, very important to use. So 
I think um, one possible meaning, there are many possible in any poem, as you know, but I, I like this one that Poetry for Students offers. It's um, an open complaint about the racism, right, that he was living in, in, the, uh, in the United States in the 1890s. Um, but blacks were persecuted for the slightest reasons, and the poem suggests they have to act apart and stay in their places and he does it beautifully. So with that idea of the one meaning, the mask is a perfect way to express that, right? Um, so one of the things I wanted to talk about though was this poem in and of itself doesn't mention the word, right? It doesn't say anything about being black. It's only by knowing who the author is that we know that we make these associations with the African-American experience. And so I think that's very interesting. I don't really want to talk about the poem without that context, but I do think it's important to note that, uh, that the poem itself could be talking about anyone's experience, because most humans have an experience where the person they present outside is different from who they feel they completely are inside. Um, when we add in the idea of an expanded view of this, of the history and the person who wrote it and the time period and the history of racism in this country, then it, the meaning is much deeper and much more significant. So I think that meaning's important. So it fits in with what W.E. Du Bois calls um, double consciousness. He's the one who coined this term and uses it. Um, and then I gave this really long quote because I thought it was great. He uses it here in his um, The Souls of Black Folks. It's, um, one, so he wrote an essay about this early on and, and then turns it into a chapter in this collection of um, essays, The Souls of Black Folks, which is very influential and I recommend it as a great way to a great reading. He explains it very clearly here. I just think it's wonderfully, I won't read the whole thing, but I invite you to spend some time looking at this um, and reading how he describes it about always having the two selves, especially as an African American person. And this has been expanded since then, again, written in the, in the late 1800s. This has been expanded to talk to about other races and other anyone who isn't what has been the dominant meaning economically socially dominant culture which is the white culture um coming from european culture for much of the planet and just this um the way that if you're going to live in in a place exist in a place where all the images you have all the discussions you have are based on an ideal that you can never be, how do you learn to exist in that time and place? For a lot of, um, specifically written about um, African Americans, but I think every culture experiences this, if you're going to be of African descent living in this country, um, how do you not hate your own skin when the culture teaches you to hate your own skin? So with very difficult um, idea of this double consciousness and we wear the mask really is a great expression of that I would say the beautiful expression of that artistically now specifically for W E I'm sorry for Paul Dunbar he I'm going to get to his biography at the end um, and I encourage you to read more about him he's very interesting but one of the things about him was that he first became known for writing poetry in dialect. And he became so popular, um, he wrote these poems as if he were speaking um, as someone, as the speakers, often someone who lives in the South and represents this dialect of a Southern person in the 1800s, a black person, sorry, of African descent, that's important. Now he wasn't the first, lots of other people at the time in the 1800s were starting to write in dialect, 
meaning trying to capture the peculiarities of someone's language to represent that more accurately. And um, he first tried this he because he grew up in uh, Ohio, and he first tried to do this with a German dialect, actually, when he was still in his teens. And then he uses this and um, writes this dialect poetry and becomes, again, famous. And not only because he writes this and publishes it and, and white people like it, and black people too, but white people like it, but he also goes touring and reads these poems, okay? So a couple things to say about this, quite a few things to say about this, but first I wanted to copy down one of his poems just because in his dialect, because my students usually really struggle with reading dialect when they see it on the page. And so I sort of wanted you to see it, um, what it looks like, how he's trying to represent this accent. And I, um, you know, don't think I'm going to try it. I lived in Texas, which is not the true South, for a short time, and I don't think I can do a Southern dialect. Um, and certainly not an African American dialect, Southern dialect, but I wanted you to see, for example, my students really struggled to read it, so let me give this, um, uh, but this is what it might have looked like. But when Moses with his power comes and sets us children free, we will praise the gracious master that has given us liberty, right? So that's my standardized English um, white person uh, dialect translation of this um, older African dialect. Um, okay, so what's important, I think, is this quote we get from Poetry for Students is that, again, so Dunbar grows up going, you know, he's, he's the son of slaves. I can go here to talk about this. He was the son of slaves, and um, he went to a high school in Ohio and was the star there and felt comfortable. He, The population of the town that he lived in was about 10% uh, African-American. He was probably the only African-American in the school, but he says, he, everyone says he felt comfortable there. I don't know where they get this proof, but that's fascinating to me. And he published quite a bit of poetry, and um, he uh, so he, he publishes this poetry and uh, again writes starts to write in, in dialect, and that's what people think is his true poetry. So when he writes something like "We wear a mask" in more um, what's the phrase here literary English, right? He preferred poems in literary English. The critics don't like that as well. Right? So we have this quote here, Dunbar preferred poems in literary English, which he felt best expressed who he was. But the dialect poems were the ones his white audience felt expressed the authentic black experience and the ones his publisher wanted. So he literally, some people, have, other critics have mentioned this. So it's not just the mask of being a black person, but it's really the mask of being a black writer in the United States, right? You cannot represent who you think you are. You cannot represent your true self because um, white critics said, no, this isn't actual true. Uh, this isn't true to the black experience as if the white critics know that, first of all, but they write that and so they dismiss him and his ability to write in literary English is dismissed. Um, and in later years, well, even at the time he was publishing, African Americans really resented that he was writing this dialect poetry because they thought it made him look bad. You're making this look stupid. You're making this look uneducated. Um, and so for many years, he was ignored as a writer also because critics really kind of, black savage, critics savaged him. And it isn't until much later that people start to realize um, how important he is, like, Henry Louis Gates Jr. in his book about Paul Dunbar says no poet in the tradition was more crucial in the shaping of a distinct African-American poetic diction or voice. So he becomes very important. He becomes, he's, he comes before the Harlem Renaissance, which is foundational for African-American art 
and he comes even before then and is really an important, important character. Um, again, I hope you'll read more about him. But at the time, and he was, again, he, he was able to support himself. He was able to live off his poetry, which is extraordinary. You can't do that today for most poets. I'm trying to think of a poet who lives off their poetry today. I don't think there are any. <laughs> so maybe songwriters are the only ones um, occasionally who can do that. So it's very hard to do that. He was able to do it back in a time when, you know, Jim Crow laws were in place. So it's pretty extraordinary. He died very young um, at 33. He had, oh, he had born with really weak lungs, contracted tuberculosis, but he also drank himself um, to death uh, because of the pain of the tuberculosis um, and other pains in his own life, uh, I'm sure, as you read more people. The critics of late have started to talk more about, even in his dialect poems, you can see rebellion, right? Right here where he's like, we, when, um, sorry, uh, African Americans will be recognized um, as important part of God's children um, eventually. Um, so people are starting to rehabilitate. I started probably in the late, in the 90s to rehabilitate who he was overall. Um, and in doing so, they don't talk about any negative parts of who he was as much. So I think that's interesting. Um, and maybe justifiably. Paul Dunbar is obviously an extraordinary poet. Um, he accomplished so much in his short life. And this poem in particular is just, I think, um, brilliant. 